I would like to introduce Joshua Solovsky to talk to you about how to measure protein conformational change in real time. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar today. Today I'll be telling you about a new technology that I and my colleagues have recently developed to measure protein conformational change in real time, sensitively and in solution. I think it hardly goes without saying that conformational change is critical to protein function. Changes in protein structure determine function, and when those changes cannot occur, or when they occur in ways other than the wild type change, they can produce dysfunction. Our technology provides a routine, easy to use, and real-time method for looking at conformational change with high sensitivity in solution. Every protein, of course, has a unique conformational landscape which determines dysfunction or function, and so many important applications can be built using our technology for drug discovery and basic research. The first question, of course, is how does the technology work? Our technology is based on a technique called second harmonic generation. This is an optical technique that is well known in physics and physical chemistry. We are applying it for the first time to study molecular biology. And as this sketch here shows, the way the the technology works is we take a protein, it can be histagged. We're also working on abitag surfaces, but for now all of our proteins are histagged. We label the proteins covalently with an SHG active dye. The dye can be attached to cysteines site specifically or to native cysteines that exist in the protein or to lysines and in that case they're generally applied unspecifically. We're able to determine where the labels are attached retrospectively after conjugating them to the protein by mass spec. And then we take these labeled proteins and we tether them to a fluid lipid bilayer membrane, which is on top of a glass surface. We have custom 384 well microplates that have glass bottoms. On top of each well of that plate, we place a lipid bilayer membrane that has nickel NTA lipids which couple to the histag so that the proteins are attached to the surface and are um, fully functional because the, the membrane is biomimetic. This is an important uh, key, key part of our technology. Many surfaces in other assays are not biomimetic. We use a lipid bilayer membrane which is and that ensures that the protein under study is fully functional as evidenced by the conformational changes we detect. So our signal, which I'll, tell, I'll explain in a little bit more detail on the next slide, is derived from the dye and specifically the dye orientation. The intensity of our signal depends on the dye orientation relative to the surface normal as shown in this, this sketch, the z-axis. And so when the protein conformational change occurs through ligand binding, whether that ligand is a small molecule, a peptide, or another protein, for example, the orientation of the dye changes, and that results in a change in the intensity that we detect. So we can detect not only spatial changes in conformational structure of the protein, but also temporal changes. If the average position of the dye is roughly the same before and after the conformational change, but the width of the distribution of the orientation changes, we're also sensitive to that. This slide gives you a, an overview of how SHG occurs and is different from fluorescence. You're probably all familiar with fluorescence. In fluorescence, you have absorption of a blue photon into an excited state followed by emission of a uh, longer wavelength or lower energy photon in the green. In SHG, we don't have an absorption event. We have a reflection event or a scattering event. In SHG, we have two photons of red light that are scattered by the dye to produce one photon of blue light. We detect the blue light, which is the second harmonic light, and that is the basis of our technology. SHG is very sensitive to conformational change and protein structure. This is the simplest governing equation that one can write, which uh, describes the intensity of SHG, that's the number of blue photons we detect per, per unit time, which is dependent on some constant 
times n squared, n being the number of molecules per unit area on the lipid bilayer membrane. There's an I squared factor, I is the fundamental or the 800 nanometer red light intensity. And there's a cosine cube theta. And the theta there is the long axis of the dye. So as the axis of the dye changes due to conformational change, closer to the Z axis or the normal to the surface or farther from it, we're able to detect very sensitively those changes in intensity. And in fact, the high order dependence on theta, there's, because there's a cubic term there, and then there's a square of that term, that translates into an ability to detect changes as small as even a degree of shift in the mean angle of orientation of the probe. The technique that we've developed is amenable to pr any protein regardless of mass. And we've built assays for proteins that are about 15 kilodaltons, up to 200 kilodaltons, and even have looked at megadalton complexes. SHG does require 2D orientation, and that can be thought of as uh, a 2D analog of the 3D lattice required by crystallography. This has important advantages for a number of assays. For example, label protein that's near the lipid bio bilayer membrane on the surface, but not attached to it, and therefore is randomly diffusing, produces no SHG at all. Only protein which is tethered to the bilayer produces a net average orientation, which is required to produce the SHG baseline signal. And then we detect changes in that baseline signal upon exposure to various ligands. We have recently, as of July, launched a commercial instrument, the Biodicy Delta, as shown here. The Delta is about the size of a refrigerator. It's easy to use, has intuitive software, has a custom 384 well microplate that comes with it, and it has high throughput. The throughput is roughly uh, an hour per 384 wells, so you can make 384 measurements in, in that time, and therefore look at thousands of interactions of your protein with small molecules, drug compounds, other proteins, other ligands in, in a single day. We've been very busy at Biodicy, as you can see from this snapshot. Over the last six months, we've alone, we've worked on 15 different projects with 12 different pharma companies in drug discovery. And those projects have spanned the full range of drug discovery activities from primary screens on assays um, that no one has ever developed before, to secondary screens, to uh, hit triaging and follow-up, and mechanism of action studies. And we've looked at lots of different target classes, including protein-protein interactions, which I won't have time to go into today, but I would uh, welcome the chance to talk to any of you offline um, in a more detailed way on any of the other projects we've worked on. We've also been increasingly collaborating with a number of academic investigators. Currently, we have 11 active projects with nine different institutions. We recently published two papers, one of which I'll be highlighting in my talk today. And we have a number of others uh, near submission. Well, let's now go into some data. The, the case study I want to present to you today is on alpha-synuclein. This is a study that we recently completed with Marcus Wechstetter at the Max Planck Institute for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen, Germany. And we published this work in the journal of Biological Chemistry. It came out in print in November. Alpha-synuclein, as some of you may know, is an intrinsically disordered protein, which means that it adopts a very wide range of different conformational states. One of these dominant conformations is this donut form, as shown here in the NMR image obtained by our collaborator in Germany. When this donut shape protein opens up, it exposes a hydrophobic patch in the interior of the protein, and that hydrophobic patch enables the protein to begin to aggregate and associate with itself. And the aggregation rate of the protein in the presence of ligands that open the donut up is greatly enhanced. In human neurons, there's a ligand called spermine, which opens the protein up and enhances the rate of aggregation of this protein by 
a factor of about 100,000 in vitro. So because the aggregation of the protein is linked to pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease, in fact, you find in the brains of patients with the disease clumps of this protein, we were interested to see if we could see that very initial, most upstream event in the aggregation of the process, namely the opening up of the donut form of this protein in the presence of spermine. And so in order to do that experiment, we created a single cysteine mutant of the protein, confirmed that it behaved just like wild type. And then as shown here on this next slide, on the left, we are able to observe in real time the conformational change. So this is labeled. A90C alpha synuclein on the surface being exposed at the arrow to a saturating dose of spermine, which is the polyamine that exists in human neurons that opens the protein up from that donut form. So the conformational change is easy to monitor by SHG. We can titrate the response as a function of spermine dose to obtain, obtain an EC50 and a dose curve of 0.79 millimolar, which agrees well with the KD determined by NMR chemical shift titration methods. At this point, we were pretty confident that we had detected conformational change, a specific opening of the protein with spermine. And we wanted next to do a study to see if we could identify any ligands or small molecules that block spermine's ability to open the protein conformation. And for this purpose, we used the Maybridge Fragment Library. This is a library consisting of a thousand different fragment compounds. Um, each of them are drug-like. We, in this case, decided to pursue a competitive assay. We pre-incubated protein in every well with a single compound from the fragment library at one millimolar. And then we added spermine to the protein and asked whether any of the compounds in the library could completely abolish spermine's effect. That was the definition of uh, a hit for this assay. We identified only one compound from the library that totally blocked spermine's effect, BIOD 303. It has favorable properties for a drug, drug-like uh, profile, um, particularly for CNS. And as you can see on this next slide, the, on the left, uh, of the top left panel, you can see spermine's uh, conformational change on the protein. On the right-hand side of that graph, you can see our compound, BIO303's change. So it, it, too, changes the conformation of the protein, but in a slightly different way than spermine does. However, in the presence of the BIO303 compound, spermine, when added following it, produces no change at all. So there's a total blocking. So on the left, you see the real-time conformational changes as measured by SHG. On the right, you see the endpoint measurements after two minutes. On the lower left, again, you see the dose curve for spermine. On the lower right, you see the dose curve for our compound, BIO303. And as indicated from the data, it's substantially more potent than spermine with an EC50 of around 100 micromolar. Well, at this point, we were confident that we had detected a ligand that could bind to the protein and block spermine's effect, but we really wanted to confirm that it, it bound via another technique. And for that, we turned to Marcus in Germany, our collaborator, provided the compound to him, and he ran HSQC 2D NMR to determine that the compound did indeed bind to the protein. It binds to a site very similar to spermines. And this was a, a very nice validation for our, our technique. There are very few compounds at all known to bind to synuclein. It's a protein that, as, as I said, is intrinsically disordered, cannot be crystallized. It's quite difficult to study by NMR, in fact. And we identified um, a ligand in a very uh, facile way using SHG that binds to this protein. And in fact, this is the first known ligand that binds to the C-terminal domain of the protein as identified by the binding site by the uh, HSQC NMR experiment. What we did next was went back to the library of fragment compounds and wanted to take a look at the closely related analogs to BIOD 303 
And so we ranked all the compounds by similarity to our main compound and chose five of them, analog one through five, as shown here in the data, and then tested them for an ability to change conformation of the protein. And as you can see here, they also bind to the protein, but to a lesser degree than BIO303 does. We then confirmed that these analogs bind to the protein, again, by HSQC and MR. These were pretty challenging experiments to do. They took, Marcus, quite a bit of time and protein and effort. In some cases, we had to go to an 80 to 1 mole ratio of compound to um, protein. So it was, it was quite challenging to do. You can see um, their chemical shift traces for analog 5 were barely discernible but we readily detected binding and conformational change by SHG of these analogs. We then also repeated our competitive assay in which we pre-incubate the protein with one of the compounds and then deliver sperming to the well with each of these five analogs. And as shown in this data, you can see that the analogs partially block spermine's response, but not fully as BIO303 does. We wanted to study what this conformational change does to the protein that BIO303 elicits. Spermine changes the conformation of the protein, but as I mentioned at the outset, it, it, it changes the protein in a way that, uh, to a conformation that greatly enhances its aggregation rate. You saw by our data, our SHG data, that, that BIO303 changes the synuclein conformation as well. We wanted to know whether that conformational change resulted in an increase in the aggregation rate similar to spermine. And what we found by running SEC uh, chromatography and 1D NMR is that BIO303, although it does change the conformation of synuclein, it, it does so in a way that preserves the monomeric form of the protein. And that can be very important when you think about a therapeutics program where you, the, the objective is to maintain the protein in its monomeric state and keep it from aggregating through oligomers to higher order states. We were intrigued by all of our data, and so we decided to study the effect of this compound, BIO303, in human neurons. And we did this in collaboration with Tiago Otero at um, the University of Göttingen Medical School. And as you can see here, we get substantial knockdown of the inclusions or aggregates of synuclein as visualized by fluorescence microscopy in human neurons when we expose the neurons to BIO303. We also get knocked down to a lesser degree with um, a couple of our analogs. We did a number of controls that I won't go into here, um, both dose-dependent studies and, and a range of biological assays to confirm that these compounds do indeed target synuclein and that and that, that, that is um, the reason that we see fewer inclusions in the cells. So in, I'd like to conclude by saying that SHG is capable of detecting uh, conformational changes in proteins very sensitively. We're, we've, uh, what the study that I've shown here uh, works with an intrinsically disordered protein which is difficult to study by NMR and cannot be studied by crystallography. I've shown you that the, we can detect ligand binding in the millimolar range. We have a range of other studies which show that we can detect binding in the nanomolar range as well. So we're sensitive to the full range of affinities that one might wish to look at. And so I think I'll stop there and acknowledge um, all of the people at Biodice who participated in this work and our collaborators in Germany, Marcus Wexstetter, Tiago Otero, and their colleagues.